Hello, uh, good morning in Mexico City, good evening in South Africa. My name is Arturo Mendoza. I am the director of the Mexican Study Center, UNAM South Africa. Uh, welcome to our webinar series, South-South Dialogues. Uh, the title of today's webinar is The Earth as a Prison, Considerations on Multi-Crisis and the Carceral in African Literary and Visual Archives. Uh, this seminar will be given by Professor Sara Nutal, director of WISER, uh, who will be in conversation with Dr. Elena Chavez MacGregor, researcher at UNAM's Aesthetic Research Institute. Uh, I would like to thank the BITS Institute for Social and Economic Research at BITS and UNAM's uh, Museum of Contemporary Art for co-hosting this event. And before we begin, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Francisco Trigo, uh, Vice Provost for International Affairs at UNAM, who will give us some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Dr. Trigo. Thank you very much. Dr. Good afternoon, South Africa. Good morning, Mexico. Uh, I would like to give a few words before we begin with this seminar. Uh, let me remind the, the origin of our relationship. Uh, four years ago, in 2016, our rector Enrique Graue visited South Africa at an invitation from our Mexican ambassador and also from uh, the president and vice chancellor, Adam Habib, and was a very pleasant visit. In, uh, this was July. Uh, 2016. Later on, the following year, President Adam Habib visited UNAM with a definite uh, and clear idea of signing an agreement to establish uh, a strong mobility of students to facilitate the exchange of academics and to invite UNAM to collaborate in the teaching of Spanish and dissemination of Mexican culture at BITS. In this way, an agreement was signed between our leaders and the Mexican Study Center was created in 2018 at the School of Literature, Language and Media at BITS, which I may say BITS is one of the most prestigious university, universities on the African continent and internationally renowned. In 2018, when I attended the inaugural event of UNAM at South Africa, I had the pleasure of meeting Sara Nuta, director of the BITS Institute for Social and Economic Research. Um, also, let me remind that uh, another uh, big event that uh, joined in this effort of collaboration with South Africa was the, in 2015, Thanks to the initiative of the South African ambassador in Mexico City, Mr. Sandil Noxina, was established the chair, the Mandel, Nelson Mandela Chair on Human Rights. And this chair, this chair was open with the main objective to raise awareness through the arts in regards to the issues that afflict our society nowadays in terms of human rights. Thus, Sarah's participation represents a significant contribution to the work in favor of human rights that the chair carries out. My pleasant meeting with Sarah Nuttall opened an avenue for academic collaboration between UNAM and BITS through UNAM South Africa. So she was invited to come to UNAM this year. Uh, however, due to the pandemic, uh, we had to postpone her visit, but we are hopeful to have he her here at UNAM sometime in the future, when obviously the epidemiological conditions allow that. The current situation has also allowed us to envision new paths for collaboration between both institutions. And finally, Sarah's participation in a couple of activities was possible thanks to the close collaboration of UNAM and Batis Rand Universities and the Mandela Chair for Human Rights. I sincerely thank this effort in carrying out South to South academic activities that foster dialogue and exchange between academics from our institution. 
Sarah, I can only thank you once again for your willingness, enthusiasm, and commitment to participate in this series of academic events. To all the organizers of this event, I express my gratitude. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Trigo. Uh, now, uh, now I will give the floor to my colleague from, uh, from MOAC, Julio Garcia. He is a deputy director for public events at, at MOAC. Uh, he will moderate the seminar. And again, thanks, Sara and Elena, for being here today. Thanks. Thank you, Arturo, and thank you, uh, Dr. Francisco. Thank you very much for your words. Um, I would just like to, to say a, a few words in, in, in Spanish and then, and, then, and then to introduce you in English. Um, bueno, como ya, lo, como ya lo mencionaba Arturo y también lo recalcaba el doctor Trigo en su, en su presentación, este, este proyecto es parte de, de una iniciativa desde, desde UNAM Internacional y también la Cátedra Mandela. Por parte del MOAC nosotros trabajamos desde la Cátedra Olivier de Bra y en este momento específico desde el seminario ¿Por qué seguir? Cultura y arte a pesar de todo impartido por Elena Chávez y Cuauhtémoc Medina. Solo, eh, mis palabras en español tienen solo el sentido de eh, anunciar un poquito la logística del evento. Eh, vamos a presentar en primer lugar una ponencia, una presentación de Sara Nutal de alrededor de 40 minutos y después de eso eh, Elena Chávez iniciará una, una conversación, una serie de preguntas para finalmente abrir eh, el, algunas dudas, comentarios y, y también preguntas para el público. Estas preguntas las tendremos a través de nuestro chat y eh, yo se las, se las estaremos haciendo llegar tanto a Elena como a Sara. Um, ok, I would, bueno, bueno, muchas gracias y, y empezaremos. Um, for our uh, audience in, in English speaking uh, places, hoping that a lot of them from South Africa, um, my name is Julio Garcia Murillo, as Arturo pointed it out, I'm Deputy Director of Public Programs at the MOAC. And um, I would just like to say that this presentation is part of our Campus Expandido seminar series. And um, it is part two of our um, extraordinary chair in visual and in visual studies, uh, Olivier Dobra. Um, uh, this session is an extraordinary session and uh, uh, an extraordinary lecture for our seminar, Por qué seguir, Cultura y Arte a pesar de todo, that we can translate as, why do we keep going? Art and culture, nonetheless, or regardless, mm -hmm. we could translate it that way too. And uh, um, it, it would be presented, uh, well, it, we, we would have a presentation by Sara Nutal, a 40 minute, around 40 minutes present, presentation by Sara Nutal, and then a conversation with Dr. Elena Chavez McGregor. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, Arturo, uh, Dr. Francisco, uh, our guest speaker, Sara, and uh, Elena. I just, um, we are very happy to have you all here, even though by digital media. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you, Julio. And thank you, Helena, so much. I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, and one of the I suppose the silver linings of a very difficult global situation is that we're managing to talk to each other in ways that we may have, um, but become so easily possible on, on online. I'm really grateful for that. Um, I want to try to talk in a way that speaks to a world that's transforming before our eyes. Um, and what draws me to this dialogue is the, is the opportunity to, to talk south specifically from Johannesburg to Mexico City. Um, and I very much welcome people from, from elsewhere who are listening to this conversation. Um, I really hope that today's session will contribute to a more sustained intellectual engagement between UNAM and WIT. Um, we began about two weeks ago a dialogue about institutions and especially universities um, and the new and the old challenges that they carry and must respond to. In today's session, I want to turn more to questions of epistemology and ontologies, um, having thought about institutions two weeks ago. 
and to try to reflect on how we could think about what I'm calling today multi-crisis. Um, by multi-crisis, I mean unprecedented scales of change across a range of phenomena which are global in their impact and interconnected in ways that many commentators are calling planetary, um, but many of which may be felt most acutely in the global south. So the opportunity, as I say, to speak south and southwards today is one that I value a great deal. Um, I also want to think about how we might work with and expand the notion of the carceral. And by the carceral or carcerality, I mean how societies have been shaped by the logics, the ideas, and the practices of imprisonment, um, even when not or not exclusively connected to prison uh, as such. So these are the ways in which I want to grapple with the changing iterations of our world uh, and our expanded notions again collectively um, as we confront questions of politics, questions of the pandemic, and questions of the earth as such. Um, now, very often in these kinds of conversations, the work of, the work of art and literature are left aside. And certainly the archives of the African are not consulted very regularly in global conversations um, or thought of as places to think from. And it's precisely those uh, terrains that I, want to, that I want to refer to in the course of my argument today. So I've titled my talk somewhat provocatively and interrogatively, the earth is a prison with a question mark after that. And what I wanted to capture and straddle by way of that question mark and offer as a terrain of investigation for us to consider relates of course to the gathering multi-crises that we face as we enter the third decade of the 21st century. And in my thinking, this has had to do variously with the growing disentanglement of the rich and the poor as the wealth gap increases exponentially the stubbornness of historical racial formations, which seem to gain new life in the present, the newly fraught conditions of the so-called alien and the stranger, only exacerbated by networks of terror, the prospect of environmental collapse, and now the global pandemic. We are undoubtedly uh, at, at present in a very dark space of world history in which earlier iterations of the prospect um, of what some saw as planetary humanism give way to intimations of planetary collapse, and in which renewed fantasies of escape um, and flight jostle against vocabularies of protest and survival as we face the loss of imagined futures on a number of levels. Now, what interests me in the, in the, in the context of today's discussion is how these fantasies of escape and the sense of what I'm calling the loss of imagined futures suggest at the same, the same time and constitutively a growing and multiplying terrain of the carceral, that is of an imprisonment in the condition of the now, in ways I want to elaborate on in what I have to say. They also, I think, by ways of advocacy and critique, propel the struggle and set the ground of contestation for what we could call decarceration a term I'll try to develop as a, a possible critical language of futurity and change in the present. Certainly the notion of a tectonic shift in both our capacity to produce political change and a feeling of renewed, uh, a renewed sense of catastrophe has been inflected by the growing climate crisis with the increasingly uncertain sustainability of the earth itself. And it's for this reason that I draw earth and the conditions of a newly fragile planet into my title and into a discussion of the carceral and imprisonment. To these lines of thought, one must immediately add the global pandemic of 2020 and its own vocabularies, of course, of imprisonment. Lockdown, first and most obviously, is itself a term drawn from the grammars of the carceral, used in prisons, schools, hospitals, and even airspace as after 9-11 and during COVID, and now across the world at large, the new orders and distributional regimes of the epidemiological and its mass quarantines and outbreak phenomena have shaped much of the last year on that planetary scale that I mentioned earlier. Now, by April of this year, 3.9 billion people were in some form of lockdown, 
and that's more than half the world's population. This included 1.3 billion people in India, 300 million in Europe, 200 million in Latin America, and 300 million or 90% of the population in the earlier months of this year in the United States. The intention of my talk then is to draw on the striking centrality of the carceral in cultural and political theory for thinking about the world across these multi-registers today. And of course, many scholars have pointed to the analytic power and possibilities of the carceral following Foucault, whose work I will allude to shortly for understanding the power dynamics of the contemporary world. I want to expand the registers of Foucault's dispositif, as he called it, that is the apparatuses, machineries, and devices of power to which he points. I want to begin though, as is appropriate, particularly since I'm offering this talk under the auspices of, or in relation to the Nelson Mandela Ch Chair of Human Rights at UNAM, with the prison as an actual space that millions of people forcibly live within. Mandela, of course, was in prison for 27 years, and the question of the rights of the incarcerated are being widely debated across many progressive circles across the world as we speak. Incarceration and prison populations today are led by the United States and China, with 2.3 million people each uh, in prison. Mexico has 203,364 people in prison currently, according to the numbers I could find. And South Africa has 163,015 people. And we know that in the United States in particular, through the work of Ruth Gilmore, Angela Davis, and others, that 34% of black men are in prison while making up only 12% of the population. We know too of the prison industrial complex through which private businesses make money servicing uh, prisons. It is a $74 billion industry and benefiting too from the exploitation of prison labor, which is very often black labor. So as we think about the carceral dimensions of the global pandemic and its lockdown practices to the scale of billions, there is the question too of what is happening to actual prison populations during COVID. We know that prisons are high risk environments for disease where pathogens are easily transmitted and that COVID spreads rapidly in conditions of overcrowding as did deaths from cholera in 19th century colonial jails. As Marland and her colleagues put it, we can quote, see how vulnerable the institutionalized populations we create become when epidemic disease takes hold. In fact, we know too that in many countries around the world, due to this global pandemic, prisoners are being released in order to avert mass outbreaks. And just to give you a sense of how many prison populations are currently being released, Iran has released almost 100,000 prisoners, which is nearly 40% of its prison population. Turkey has, received, has released 31% of its prisoners, but excluded political prisoners from that number. There have been protests and mass prison escapes in Brazil, and South Africa has released 19,000 prisoners since March of this year, incarcerated for nonviolent crimes. The United Kingdom has released 18 prisoners, and is building 2,000 new prison cells. Now, historically, writes Catherine Bruce Lockhart, prison releases have been isolated acts that have not fundamentally challenged the prison system itself. But the scale of the COVID releases could be, some argue, a step towards decarceration and strengthen the hand of prison abolitionists towards systemic change. In South Africa in 2020, low risk inmates have been released. Early parole has been given to those sentenced for quote, crimes of need. In other words, not murder, gender-based violence, child abuse, and other violence crimes, but crimes often caused by um, poverty and dispossession, now called for the first time, crimes of need. But thousands remain behind bars in dangerous conditions. Many are arguing for the release of prisoners uh, and that it is now about our collective safety. There's a growing demand for criminal justice reform to imprison fewer people, and a critical view that detention facilities are not separate from the rest of social life, but spaces which are entangled with, with all of us, as this pandemic only amplifies. For example, as prison personnel move in and out of communities, 
potentially infecting them and vice versa, for example. So I want to end this very first section of my remarks um, by, by, by articulating how much we must fight and uphold the rights of incarcerated people and build the case for decarceration and the diminishment of imprisoned populations. Some will argue for outright abolition. Now, in doing so, and making the shift to the aesthetic forms I want to place at the heart of my argument today, I turn briefly and firstly to the work of two South African photographers. Um, I want to um, turn very briefly to, to the, the work firstly of Ernest Cole, who did much of his photographic work in the 60s and 70s in South Africa. Now, his photographs inside apartheid's prisons remain the most striking archive of cultural exploitation in a wider system of structural racism that we have, in my view. In fact, I've chosen not to show many of these photographs, a number of them showing black men stripped naked for inspections by officials or showering in unhygienic and crowded prison conditions. This first photograph attached will stand in for those photographs, which are readily available to you online, which, which may well be triggering for many viewing them for the first time. Many of Cole's photographs, though not his prison photographs, were only recently discovered, and there's renewed interest and analysis in his work, most recently by Candace Janssen, who recently finished her PhD at Weiser. And this is a photograph of Cole, who lived from 1940 to 1990, and was this country's first black freelance photographer. And in his book, um, House of Bondage, 1967, he photographed black life, in a way still seldom surpassed in South Africa today. A second photograph by way of beginning the second section is one taken by contemporary Johannesburg-based South African photographer Michiel Zubotsky in Polesmoor Prison in Cape Town. It's taken before the pandemic, of course, but the painful overcrowding and enforced intimacies in his image of prisoners in a single room reveal, um, can now be read, of course, in terms of the pandemic that they so easily foster. The compositional power of both Cole and Zubotsky's photographs and their wider bodies of work takes us further than the prison walls to suggest the conditions of the carceral as the prevailing conditions of the social as such. Here are further photographs from Cole um, of men crowded together holding their past papers during the apartheid period. Um, I, I assume, and of mass crowding on a train in a station in an era in which public transport for black people was poor, infrequent, and unhygienic. Now, Zubotsky went on to photograph Ponte Tower in Johannesburg, um, the tallest residential tower in Africa, apparently, in images that look extraordinarily prison-like, so-called apartments, which appear cell-like at night. Uh, and, you know, full of poverty and overcrowding, again, jamming people into very small spaces. And so the sense of the moving from the prison to the carceral as such, I think, is very powerful in, in these images. And this is an image of, of Zubotsky. Now, here I want to, to recall um, that while Nelson Mandela was in prison on Robben Island, where he spent 27 years, Winnie Mandela was banished to a small town in rural South Africa called Brantford. Now, Sisonki Msimang, Winnie Mandela's most recent biographer, addresses Winnie in the second person thus, and quotes, the conditions in which you live in this place of banishment are desolate and bare, but no more so than the conditions of your neighbors who have committed no crime and are not serving any penal sentence. Your banishment is thus a metaphor. It speaks to the banishment of all black South Africans. Your sentence is a mere reflection of the collective conditions of black people. Those are, are, who are outside prison walls, in Simang writes, are simply in a bigger prison. Not uh, only the apartheid government could banish someone to a place where others live, not as prisoners, but as ordinary black subjects. And this question of moving from the prisoner to the ordinary black subject are some of South Africa's um, most profound testimonies in these photographs I've shown you although they are not documentary photographs as such, to the carceral then and today. They straddle the apartheid and post-apartheid periods between them. And though I am not one to deny the gains made for some, if not many, in the aftermath of that system, facilitated by democratic transition, 
The continuity by another name remains stark, nevertheless. And prisons uh, reveal uh, you, you know, these in very, very important ways. I want to turn then very briefly before I continue to the work of Foucault, who remains so important in an analysis of the conditions of the carceral, including the techniques and procedures for controlling populations and the insertion of the power to punish ever more deeply into the human body. His great book, Discipline and Punish, was written against the backdrop of prison revolts and calls for prison reform, calls that are again growing steadily today in the contemporary period. As I point in the first instance to the incarceration, decarceration dynamic at work in these times, I point too to the distributional regimes of human life itself, the ways in which they involve the, the redistribution of life, often via processes of imprisonment, but also of managing and marginalizing the poor and of offshoring, citadelization, and enclaving amongst the wealthy. Some have refer, referred to this as apartheid planetary afterlife. Foucault, as we must note, barely addressed the question of race, certainly didn't consider the African archive as offering a place to think from, and definitely didn't imagine or factor in climate change in developing his notions of the carceral today. And one needs then a form of carceral critique and of decarceral possibility that would suggest, uh, I suggest, that draws in these multiple registers and multi-crisis, but also one which allows the carceral to be changed and expanded in the process. Now, histories of slavery, apartheid, plunder, discrimination, and resegregation examined and analyzed by activist scholars working in subaltern, post-colonial, African-American, black, and decolonial studies, amongst others, have shown and continue to show how the category of the human has been afforded more fully to some and not to others and to others. Some of this work has now also begun to extend itself in relation to a critique of the plundering of the earth itself. African aesthetic archives work at multiple intersections of the inhuman, human, and non-human nexus as they compose themselves within histories of violence and transfiguration. They take on inflections that at times draw more widely on black experience uh, uh, and at other times depart from, for example, United States-based figuration. Certainly, they converge around a, crit a critique of Western humanism and come closer collectively to Sylvia Winter's powerful formulation of the problem at hand, especially when we want to use such concepts like the planetary or the earth itself. Winter talks about the human yet to come, suggesting implicitly that it is through the confrontation with a racialized capitalism, or a capitalist scene, as Donna Haraway has put it, that have in many ways produced the unsustainability of the earth system itself, that we can, that we can even consider the prospect of learning to be human collectively for the very first time. So I turn now to African archives, um, and I'll move a little more quickly through what it is that I have to say next, bearing in mind the time. I want to consider three sets of work, works which refract and elaborate on aspects of the earth as a prison argument as I've set it out above. And I want to look first at several more works from South Africa speaking to these histories, as I call them above, of violence and transfiguration and of animism and the ancestral, working across human and more than human boundaries in powerfully politicized ways. I move then to the loss of the earth as a catastrophe of environmental collapse and lastly, to discourses of disentanglements and terrestrial exits, often invoked by Afrofuturism and Afro-pessimism. Now, at the entrance of the heritage, heritage precinct of, the, of Johannesburg's constitutional court, which is in fact built on the site um, of many, many prisons, of a prison complex during the apartheid period, right in the heart of Johannesburg and near Witts University, there is a sculpture by South African artist Emily Fanny Made sometime in the late 60s or early 70s, it is simply called history. It's made of black burnished metal and it reveals four entangled figures. Indistinct man-woman figure seated on what appears to be the bench of a cart. As Paul Clark has beautifully written, the bench reveals itself to be a prostrated man-body thing, its head peering through the seated person's legs. The pulling figure's hands have become feet-like its arms, legs, and its legs trunks. This composite body, part man, 
part ungulate, meaning clawed, is pure force, writes Carl. And this is not the triumphant blending of human and animal, he notes, but an unnerving rendering of life captured for its muscular capacity. Clark reads this body as we must, as a reflection historically on black life in Johannesburg. A becoming alien, he writes, a becoming animal, revising old but still deadly racial and national distinctions through embodied practices in their most radical forms as our modes of encountering difference broaden in an Anthropocene inflected way. And I'll have more to say on whether we should use that term Anthropocene at all. I'm using it for now and I'm quoting from him. Fenny's distorted figures, most often in the form of fi fine line drawings, despite the sculpture I've shown here, have the appearance of having been deformed physically by the brutal forces of society itself. His man-body thing in history experiments with form, rejects realism, re-examines almost everything at the same time, and produces an aesthetic introspection which we know as modernist. The work speaks of a previous historical era, the ongoing human injustices in the present, and beyond, to the modes of encountering difference and inhumanity in the unfolding world um, uh, 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 um, of, of multi-crisis to come. And this is a picture of Fanny working um, at, at sculptural form. I want to move now very, very quickly on to the post-apartheid period in which a number of films and novels including the film District 9 that some of you may have seen, and Lauren Bierkes' novel Zoo City, responds symptomatically to post-apartheid Johannesburg. In the former, alien figures called prawns come to inhabit the city's shack lands and informal settlements. Locals speak about them in the same language used for xenophobia in the city's poorest areas. And indeed, the soundtracks used are recordings of actual xenophobic rantings against Nigerians in Johannesburg. Towards the end of that film, the main human character becomes infected, in quote, by an alien and non-human body of the prawn, taking on mutant form. And in the novel Zoo City, human characters, as rendered in this image, are tethered to animal others, as the novel explores how to be animal is to be forced to accept intimacy with an extreme other. Both are potent filters for contemporary Johannesburg's filmic and fictional imaginaries, but neither, I would argue, carry the force of Fanny's sculpture called history. The final image I'd like to show in this section before moving on is this one. Um, it's a performance piece of live art by Setembile Msezane, performed in response to and situated within student movements for decolonizing the university at the University of Cape Town in 2016. The piece is called Chapungu, The Day Roads Fell. And I want to show you a second image, which is not as clear, um, because I want to point to the fact that her wings, her extended ancestral wings, in fact, look as if they join exactly the crane, which is removing the statue of Rhodes uh, as it gets taken down. So a beautiful rendering there, but a less clear picture than this one. Now, Chapungu is a sacred or totemic animal of the Shona, found in sculptural form in Great Zimbabwe um, from the 11th century, an eagle held to be a messenger from the ancestors. And as she, the artist, extends her human limited arms by the symbolic wings of the bird, ideas of escape from imprisonment, of an imprisonment within the codes of a university that decolonization would fundamentally challenge, and the rising of the powers of the spiritual are invoked with the assistance of the ancestral, which is not so much separate from the human world, but is evident uh, within the human world, as Carly Pustia has beautifully uh, um, rendered this political aesthetic. Um, and of course, the cell phone uh, mediates uh, and take even further the form of flight um, and escape that is articulated uh, in this image. It is wrought from the trauma of confronting colonialism legacies in the present, including its capacity to wreak symbolic harm on, uh, to those who, particularly black students, must suffer its ongoing legacies in the present, including at universities. And South Africa has been very, very powerful um, in articulating um, decolonial form in these and other ways. 
So the work that I've considered here insistently politicized, I hope you'll agree, the categories of the human, the inhuman, and the more than human, generating and rerouting them through conditions of radical precarity and structural racism. This is really important, I think, in response to those who remain skeptical of the political consequence, consequences of invoking non-human forms in the very aftermath of post-colonial transformation. And importantly, I would argue, for considerations of imprisonment and the carceral, these forms that I've shown you offer a vocabulary for thinking with the shackled human, rendered mutant or tethered to animal form, as well as the perform performative dimensions of the ongoing struggle against dehumanization and for decolonization. Now, in the second uh, section of my presentation, I move now to Dakar, Senegal, um, and I focus on the loss of the earth as a catastrophe of environmental collapse by looking in particular uh, at the question of human bodies and African bodies rendered as debris or waste. And I turn to the Benin-born Dakar-based artist Fabrice Montero and his depictions of prosthetic form. Um, what he does, Fabrice Montero, is place larger than human scaffolded prosthetic figures in Senegal's most environmentally depleted places. And in this image, a female figure with a partial fish-like form, recalling the Mamawati figure of West Africa, of West African folklore, um, and an extended right arm with, a para with parahuman fingers emerges from the ocean. Behind her, a beached oil tanker drenched in water and oil. Her face is barely distinguishable and appears to have turned into black matter. She is a creature that has the appearance of a damaged human being whose signature is now deeply associated with the products of extra extraction, in this case, oil. Montero, the artist, says this, quote, I wanted to make images which associate animism and ecology for, for a better reading of the problem we face. This is, this is the second image, and I'll move quite quickly through these in the, in the interest of time, but he clearly abandons the art gallery in favor of the outside world. And here we see a, ru a ruined human landscape that is gradually being destroyed by, by oceanic forces. The scene has been vacated by people, yet still there is a human signature on the landscape. It becomes difficult to separate the human from a state of urban abandonment. And the figure is not entirely a human figure, it appears part of the landscape of ruined built forms a part of material life. Um, Africa, as we know, is one of the continents most vulnerable to radical climate change. And recent articles have shown the city of San Luis in Senegal, not far from here, slowly sinking into the waters as sea level rises, its bridges now lapped by rising water. We know too that Africa is the toxic dumping ground of the North, hazardous waste dumped along Africa's coast, including on the Somalian coast in particular including radioactive uranium uh, waste, mercury, industrial hospital, chemical, and other toxic waste, including e-waste. The littoral world, that is the world on the edge of the sea, is a dystopian and toxic wet border, um, which bears witness to the carceral, the carceral proportions of toxic dumping and industrial effluent. And I'll very quickly show you two further um, images from his work, which I think are particularly striking. Here, a prosthetic woman um, against the backdrop of fire. And we know now that fire and heat is a global condition. And of course, she will soon be burned by those fires, burned up by those fires. Um, and here, a final work by Montero, um, which shows a woman on a mountain of waste, made herself from waste materials. And I really just want to conclude this section by pointing out um, that Montero's prosthetic figures are now testaments to a land and an earth ravaged by waste, toxicity, and climate change, but which reference figures drawn from earlier ritual performances, um, which privileged forms um, that appeared on silt and wooden masks and often clothed in vegetal materials. Such earlier figures would have been very significant, were very significant in African performative archives, which drew on forms of giganticism within a broader world of multiple beings of and in various dimensions. I would argue before leaving this section for my final section, that the carceral here, in my extended reading of the carceral, speaks to the confinement in a continent, a continent said to be the worst hit by massive drought, 
floods, sea level rise and pollution, the victim and dumping ground of Western capitalism's dark carbon spewing and its designation of the body of a continent as much as of, of African bodies themselves as subject to the waste and effluence of the world. Now, in the final section that I move to before my conclusion, um, I'm going to skip over that novel, which also talks to forms of giganticism in Lagos and its polluted waters, uh, which we could talk about another time. In the final section or constellation I want to consider today, I begin with two examples from the African diaspora. So much African aesthetic work has, after all, been fundamentally in conversation with these diasporic archives, although the reverse has sometimes been far less true. I find that African-American and Black British archives still seldom reference the African archives. And the African-American writer Ta-Nehisi Coates writes in his epistolatory memoir, which is called Between the World and Me, that Americans believe in the reality, as he puts it, of race as a defined feature of the natural world. In other words, race is naturalized in the American world. Thus, it follows, he writes, that one is left to deplore racism the way one deplores an earthquake, a tornado. As a child, he came to understand his country as a galaxy, and that while one portion of this galaxy was liberated, another, his own portion, was enslaved by tenacious gravity. I knew that some inscrutable energy preserved the breach. I felt but did not yet understand the relation between that other world and me. And he asked himself, why was life so different out there in that other world past the asteroid? The plunder of dark energy was at the heart of our galaxy. Being black, Coates writes in this letter to his son, which forms his memoir, reflecting on his own youth, as, as someone, um, which was someone's name for a human turned object in a planetary system which makes your body breakable. As a young man, Coates writes, he is infused with an abiding, irrepressible desire to unshackle my body and achieve the velocity of escape. A form of prison riot, you could say, decarceration, a bid for abolition, and a form of a desperately desired freedom. Later in his life, after Trayvon Martin's killer was acquitted, he begins to accept that, quote, there is no velocity of escape. My life was the immediate negotiation of violence. Towards the end of his book, Coates considers that the dreamers, that is the American dream, alive to those people who believe themselves to be white, as he puts it, plunders not just the bodies of humans, but the bodies of the earth, the body of the earth itself. The dream, he writes, is the same habit that endangers the planet. It's such a powerful book, and it's one in which I believe decolonial thinkers and writers and artists in South Africa are very much um, in, in conversation with. I will just point out that in the final sequence, Coates and his family move to Paris, a place he considers, quote, a different galaxy far away from the debilitations of being black in America. As a range of his readers outside the United States have pointed out though, Coates does not do enough to consider the experiences of racial exclusion by people from Algeria, uh, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, and so many other African diasporic, uh, so many other African uh, countries in France today. So there's an elision as well, I think, um, in relation the kind of racism that Africans might feel in Europe today. Um, now, I'll skip a little bit uh, 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 in relation to the, the, the Black British work that I wanted to talk about, except to say that somebody like Kodwa Ishtar, which I refer you to, um, has worked very, very profoundly on musical forms which try to go beyond the human and the human body and to travel, he quote, he says, in fact, uh, recalling the words of Eric Davis, beyond the existing forces of life. So in this final section, as I move towards my conclusion in relation to thinking about the carceral, I want to turn to those artists who've thought about um, other orders of being altogether, right? Other orders of being that are non-terrestrial in many cases. Um, and if we, you know, I think that this goes back to Du Bois discarding the limitations of allowable thought 
reckoning with strangeness in Sun Ra's words, or embracing what Paul Gilroy has called the politics of transfiguration. And these traditions offer a very powerful vantage point from which to consider the theme of the earth as a prison, now really invoking racialized histories and the history of racism and its contemporary manifestations by drawing together a critique of racism and a critique of the plundering of the earth itself. If we think about how South and Southern African artists and writers are approaching these questions, I would only refer you to the work um, of artists in Johannesburg um, who are trying to decolonize the online world of the internet, the so decolonial technologies and the art forms associated with that. So rather than thinking about going off world as an earlier generation of black thinkers had thought, and Du Bois included, um, these artists are thinking about the online world and the way in which it reproduces the power relations and the carcerality of the offline, offline world. So Facebook slums, Twitter elites, countries trying to claim their own internet spaces, online internet refugees, digital refugees migrating in order to have access to the internet and so on. And these artists are asking how bloodlines, ancestral lines, who you are, where you come from, um, where you will return to work online. Uh, there's some extraordinary good work by digital artists, including Tabita Rizer, Tabita Rizer, who is thinking about going forward while looking back, using African past to negotiate African futures, including online futures, and navigating sort of decolonial pathways on the internet uh, in relation to what she calls mul the multiverse. I called it the multi-crisis, she calls it the multiverse. Um, so let me move to, to conclusion and I will conclude very quickly. I know you've been listening for a long time. If this talk began with the prison and its analytical representations and repertoires, as well as its political stakes in the pandemic of the present, I then moved on to consider the ensembles of the carceral de decarceral complex rather than the actual prison itself. By looking at examples from African art and literature, I wanted to consider ways in which this archive extends the Foucauldian carceral by crucially considering the centrality of race to these earlier deliberations, insisting on Africa-based epistemologies instructive to this work and incorporating the ways in which these artists are thinking about the sustainability of the earth itself. Um, what we could call, if you like, the African Anthropocene body of knowledge uh, and how it teaches us how we might approach and reapproach the question of the carceral today. Um, I've really then been wanting in this talk to think about, on the one hand, reanimating the living vitality of the earth system itself, which African um, pre-colonial thinkers were doing long before we started theorizing the Anthropocene, that's for sure. But also those traditions who are committed to discarding the dimensions of allowable thought, insisting on the power of the as yet unthought perhaps, to use Saidiya Hartman's term, including ways of going off world uh, or online to a better place and as a means of scaling the prison gates, transgressing the laws of the carceral state for good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, it's amazing to, to hear you and I know it's been tough I and mean, we've been trying to, to get spaces for, for keep with the collaboration and, and it hasn't been possible, but I am very happy that at least we have these yeah. possibilities nowadays. Uh, so I want to, to start thanking uh, Dr. Trigo and of course Arturo Mendoza, who is head of the, the UNAM Center in Johannesburg and Julio Garcia Murillo, that is the head of uh, public programs at MAC and all the team of MAC because these things uh, are a little bit complicated to, to be able to do it. So I really thank all the team. Um, and also of course, Sarah, uh, we've been in a kind of, on and off collaboration since, I don't know, like a decade yeah. ago mm -hmm. in Mexico in 2011, I think it was. Yeah. So um, I want to thank, and, and I, I want to, to, I mean, this, this, this intervention of Sarah is also, I mean, it's like the um, conjunction of the 
of the chair of the Mandela, the Mandela chair in, in, at the UNAM, uh, trying to address issues of human rights, but also it's very much in the, in the seminar and most of the people that are in the Zoom are part of the seminar that I'm doing with Gautamak Medina, Medina this term and it's called um, how to keep going art and culture in spite of everything or something like that. So we've been working for the last three months, I think, in a very, very complex way because all the classes, of course, are online, but also it has been very interesting in terms of getting in contact with a lot of people, including students that are not in the city, but also in other parts of the country. So it has been very interesting. I'm very glad that I see lots of, of them, of the participants of the seminar here. Um, but in this seminar, we've been trying to, in order to address the issue of how to keep going and why to produce art, uh, we've been trying to open different archives. So uh, one of the first was uh, Francis Alice with his latest work in, in Iraq or Ursula Biman in, in, with her work in Colombia with Indigenous University, um, also now you, and then we will have the participation of the Charani Collective, uh, that it's a group in, in Mexico, in Michoacan. But one of the things that I think it's important in this seminar, um, it's what you're doing, and it's this idea of sharing archives, and that mm -hmm. it's important to share those archives in order to create other possibilities of thinking and expand thinking and expand notions that somehow has had been very important in Western thinking as Foucault, as you frame it in, in, in the car serial, but to expand it with other archives to create other forms of narratives and possibilities and that. And I think it's important in this kind of collaboration that we somehow Africa seems very far from us. And it's very interesting and important that we share those archives and that we start creating other, other bridges that they don't need to cross through the, uh, through the more hege hegemonic uh, spaces of knowledge, meaning the States or Europe. So it's very interesting and very important, I think, the, the collaboration that can be framed in, in that way. Um, so I'm going to, to make some questions around your presentation or to open and then we'll open to the, the rest of the participants of the seminar. Um, so I want to start by saying that your presentation allowed me to think the vocabulary of this pandemic in other frames. Um, I had been thinking in the military use of the governmental instructions, but it, I think it's extremely interesting to point out the carceral structure, uh, structures of today I mean, not, not, not only for the lockdown and the isolation that we have um, been ex experienced and the expel of the public realm uh, that the pandemic has brought, but also to explore, as you say in your paper, uh, a distributional regimes of the human in itself. So to expand the notion of, of the carceral to, to think at other forms of experience. So in that sense, the carceral, of course, make us think on those who are in real imprisonment today and the present conditions of it. Uh, mass incarceration, as we have seen in the latest protests of, uh, in, in the US, it has a huge political problem. Um, mass incarceration is not only entangled with uh, the privatization of the prison, that is a, a huge topic in the States, but also with racist logics that can be traced uh, to slavery. Um, I think, I mean, if I, if I, if I follow you correctly, uh, to open the question of the earth as a prison is to stretch the conditions of the carceral to the living. Um, so the carceral as a condition that for many is the everyday experience and doesn't limit to the prison, but it expands to a notion of the earth in which the whole earth is conceived as a prison because of the logic that constitute uh, societies. Um, so I think in that sense that the archives you present allow us to give us a glimpse of those experiences, of those experiences of the living as a carceral. Um, and I want to go, I mean, I, it's very interesting as well to have like the archives of some African artistic practices and to put some kind of 
tension in there with some, uh, let's say, um, diaspora practices. I don't know how to mm. call them yeah. um, or artistic practices that are done in the United States and, and the UK mainly, and that can be called, I guess, Afrofuturism. And it's very interesting to, to tense those, those two narratives in the sense that um, the construction of, that they do in relation to the history and also in relation to the future. So in those forms of the carceral in the African archive, I think there is um, um, a need to go to, to the past and to make some kind of um, repair work through the past. And mm -hmm. in the case of the Afrofuturism, there is this need to invent a history as, and I mean, of course, politically, um, the importance of the Afrofuturism was that as they had like a denial past, they needed to invent a past. And so they invent some African past that maybe the, or a history that maybe didn't exist and didn't follow the African needs of that. Uh, yeah. to, I don't know, to, to, to deal with history and with past. So I would like in like in like a, a first uh, set of questions, if you could help us to expand this tension in between th these two archives, even if they're both part of this kind of uh, expansion that you do of the carceral of forms of living, which black people mainly has suffered this experience, how you relate or how the tension in between this, these two narratives can create different forms of paths for creating future or for approaching future and for approaching past. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I like the question how to keep going. I think that's a really excellent uh, <laughs> sort of zeitgeist name for a seminar. Um, and I think that it pertains to everything that we're talking about today in relation to the conditions of the carceral. Um, and I very much like, you know, Helen, the way you initially said, well, how we keep going is we share archives, because I think that's such a, you know, it's it's such a, um, uh, it's such a, po a positive response to a very difficult situation in the sense that we use this opportunity to, to, to theorize together again from multiple vantage points. Um, you know, and you said Africa feels so far away, and and I I want I'd like to ask you ask you back now or another time. Um, you know what what the nature of that distance is in relation to to, to Mexico. Um, um, so let's see if we can do the work of you know bringing it a little bit closer. Um, you know what one of the ways that we might be able to open that conversation is of course our shared relationship with and yet and yet different experience of the kinds of issues I'm talking about today, including race, uh, from the United States, which has tended to dominate dominate the, the archive in relation to, to, to race and how we might want to think about blackness today. I mean, um, I think that I think that you've, I mean, you've, you've, you've given us a very interesting articulation of the kinds of tensions between, you know, a set of African archives and a set of diasporic archives, as I was laying them out today. And I think it's true that um, the American archive will invent a version of the African archive, which may not be a version that Africa-based artists and pre-colonial forms of art um, have spoken to or want to speak to today. Um, they do offer us two, uh, two exceptionally interesting, interesting pathways. I think that, I mean, you mentioned the work of repair. Um, I think that it's based around the sort of carceral ecological, for example, or the Anthropocene, um, do turn very, very productively to pre-colonial pasts in Africa. Because after all, these are terrains where people were working, you know, in in all kinds of ways and in all sorts of contexts of precarity, you know, and dispossession before the colonial period. 
to use and reuse and repair um, versions and lived conditions of the human by extending that to a kind of compositional multiplicity uh, with the non-human. And I think that there are all kinds of ways in which we ought to be turning to those archives to, 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 to think about the question of the earth now, which does go to the question of the human and other than human. Um, and I would love to see how an argument would look uh, in relation to those African pre-colonial pasts and in relation to Mexican pasts. Um, and so all kinds of resources um, can be drawn um, from those domains of African form making and thought making um, to correct and re-articulate the ways in which invocations of the, Anth the Anthropocene, for example, or even debates around the earth tend to um, launder out these kinds of pasts, these kinds of histories. Um, I think that um, aspects of the African-American archive are incredibly powerful, as I was trying to articulate, for thinking us, for helping us to think beyond, um, for helping us to think about what many people in the current critical terrain are calling, uh, you know, abolitionism as a critical practice, um, and which is, which, and which Afro-pessimism is really turning, turning its, its thoughts to incredibly potently. So, so those forms of Afrofuturism are very interesting to read in relation to notions of Afro-pessimism, which talk about abolition um, on all kinds of scales, including the abolition of the social as we know it, in order to rebuild uh, across completely different pathways. And to, I suppose, speak to Sylvia Winter's formulation of the human year to come. So these are different pathways um, and they do offer different resources. And I think what's been really interested in recent decolonial debates as I read them in South Africa is that they, they are in fact drawing from both resources. So from um, articulations of black history coming out of the United States, but also articulations of the ancestral and to some extent the animus that are coming from Africa-based ideas about um, about the earth, about the human, post-human, uh, non-human, in, inhuman, etc. And so um, there is a divergence. There's an interesting divergence of paths, um, and it would be amazing to try to think with Mexico in relation to those paths which are charted, I think, most creatively and fundamentally by black artists and, and writers and theorists at this point. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think it's super interesting and I, I really intrigued by, by many of these uh, tensions in between these narratives as well in, in terms yeah. of the production of temporality and, and which are the consequences in terms of um, trying to invent, address, uh, invoke a future in a way. Another thing that I was thinking uh, when I got your paper, um, it's in this critique of the Anthropocene. So we we've been working a little bit around this for the last year. Mm, so the, 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 the other seminar we gave last year was about animism. There's also, I find like a tension between the notion of the world and the notion of the earth. Yeah. Um, as to possibilities of critique in a way. So we were uh, reading in, in this seminar also uh, Deborah Donovsky and Eduardo Viveiros de Castro. I don't know if you know them. Uh, they're very uh, quite important uh, thinkers uh, of the decolonial in Brazil. And they did um, a book, um, Is There Any World to Come? So it's very interesting as well that in some of the Amerindian archives that people are trying to, to, to make more visible, or even in, in some theories as um, uh, Donna Haraway or Anna Tseng, uh, there is this, this um, or some, some, some people trying to think against or beyond Anthropocene, uh, how the archives of the Amerindians could bring another set of relations uh, with the abolition of the world in the, in the construction of the world that Western made and that maybe the notion of the earth, maybe not 
as a planetary construction, but more as a local yeah. earth or land or refer yeah, kind of reference to the land uh, could bring other set of relationships with the living and non-living that kind um, that might avoid the 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 weight of the of the um, the human and all capitalism, patriarchy, racism, mm -hmm. and all those mm -hmm. uh, logics that are there. So I don't know if you want to to go a little bit into that. I mean, if you see that there can be also like a tension in between the notion of the earth and the notion of the world. Yeah, you know, ab absolutely. Um, there, there's. Um... I'm reading different different work from 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 the ones that that you're reading, but there's a book by Kelly Oliver Kelly Oliver called Earth and World, and she takes us back to 1968 and those sort of those those photographs of the Earth from 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 space, but of course, you know, and the sort of environmental movement etc. Beginning, but that, 1968 also when Martin Luther King is killed and and the foreclosing of a whole set of imagined futures. Um, in terms of the civil rights movement at the time. And so what one has to have a sort of a historical angle on this. I think that's very important, but also a tremendous worry about using these terms. And so, you know, should, should we use the Anthropocene as a kind of shorthand for a very complex set of debates, knowing that it's a sort of spectacular exiting of responsibility on the part of those who claim the category human in the first place, right? And who are, are who are who have produced such radical climate change? In other words, people um, in the west or the, the west or the north. Or does one sort of use these categories in a knowing and very politically conscious way? So I mean, I, I just want to acknowledge that you know there, there are there are difficulties with the, the term. And yeah, the question of the planetary is a, is also a difficult one because many will be arguing that the invocation of the planetary is just a sort of upscaling. Um, of the global, sort of to the tune of the Anthropocene, and in fact, what we what we lose when we invoke these kinds of articulations of the planetary is precisely the heterogeneity of the local. Um, mm. I think there is an argument to be made that one of the true effects of multi-crisis, as I was depicting it, is the intensification of place, which we could call the local, of local place. Because it becomes this incredibly intensified space uh, in which um, not only is human history so radically contested, um, but the, the, the climate and the atmosphere in, in, which we, in which we exist as humans is now so radically disturbed. And so I think there is an argument that if one wanted to use any kind of notion of the Anthropocene or the planetary, that it's precisely the intensification of the local um, that becomes the that becomes the, the the sort of central nexus, which then might stretch out to the question of the earth, um, but is fundamentally located in place. So I, you know, I, I think, you know, I think I love to give these talks when I'm still wrestling with these questions. So many scholars, including scholars. Who, who call themselves scholars of the South are, you know, resorting to notions of the planetary, for example. But yeah. I do know that that's very, very much in tension with um, with the decolonial, actually, um, and 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 the unwillingness of, I think, sort of decolonial thinking, certainly in South Africa, to to move to the scale of the Earth or the planetary, um, while wrestling with how we work with climate change inside of these discourses. So, you know, Helena, just really to, to echo and acknowledge the, the difficulties of these articulations, the importance of, you know, rethinking with the historical past and its a, a sort of aesthetic repertoires, to try to be very careful about not just uh, find the correct methodologies and scale for the kind of work that we want to do, that is, that is the kind of politically inflected work that we want to do. What is the methodology, what is the scale to which we want to work, and to and to perhaps resist always going to a larger scale mm. in our in, in the kinds of arguments we want to want to make. So, you know, I acknowledge that I'm uncertain about that. Part of me knows that we have to reach towards the planetary scale of what is before us in this pandemic, uh, and given the kind of climate change that's going on, 
But yeah, absolutely. The challenge is not to undercut all the work that social theory has done, nor the specificity of and the heterogeneity of what it is that we're experiencing in play, you know, in Mexico or South Africa today. So for sure, yeah. Thank you. Um, so maybe I had another another set of uh, questions. Um, I don't know if that can be. I mean, I if I understood correctly, I mean the the argument that I find super interesting that you're doing is that um, like the carceral uh, doesn't limit to the prison or some kind of dispositives or mm. apparatus. Mm -hmm of mm. control as the prison, the hospital, the school, the university, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so many, as Foucault described them, but like to expand to a notion of that, yeah, from it's a regime of distribution and visibility and, and more like in this kind of Ranserian and way, um, but also like that is experience for a lot of, the, the everyday experience for a lot of people of being in this kind of situation of the carceral as a dispositive of exclusion, uh, yeah. exclusion of the public, uh, isolation, conditions of um, yeah. uh, non-human conditions of living, let's say, uh, in yeah. this kind of Western uh, old yeah. cultural ideas. But I was, maybe this is a silly question, but I was thinking that if you think that the movement that is going that is happening mostly in the United States, again, um, around uh, the critique of mass incarceration could have an effect on this kind of logic uh, or expansion to the carceral, to forms of living. I mean, if you think, I mean, I, I would say that of course it's related that the, the protest against um, the racist logics in the States are creating as well. And of course, I mean, if you have someone like um, uh, Angela Davis that has been fighting for the, the racism mm -hmm. and now is fighting for the, the, the mass incarceration. And thinking this now, because as far as I know, um, Biden, that it might be the next president of the States if there's no civil war in, war in there, uh, was one of the heads of the construction of the blueprint of the mass incarceration as it works today in the States. So I was thinking that if you thought that also like how it's connected and if that can create some, that the, the transformation of the incarceration can create some, um, some cracks in this kind of uh, yeah. Yeah. Of this position. Yeah, well, I mean, I was taking the idea that um, of the decarceral as, as a potential critical and political possibility based around the mass release of prisoners during the pandemic and how one might be able to harness that as a critical resource for thinking in the terrains that we work in which is the terrains of the sort of political aesthetic um, and i was wanting to point to the differences between decarceration um, which is uh, which i think is still in some senses part of an argument for criminal justice and of and abolition which is really an argument for um, for for, clo for for closing prisons and destroying the structures of the social. Um, and so I wanted, I was wanting to, to to look at, and the way I work is tend, you know, I don't tend to be definitive. I tend to try to start to articulate for us. Okay, we have the, the carceral. Um, I've tried to extend the terrain of that analytically. And then we have the beginnings of something we could call the decarceral, which would indeed be building on the, the kinds of critiques that Angela Davis has been making, but also the kinds of critiques that are only emerging now for the first time as a structural possibility through the pandemic and what it does to the prison, quite literally. How could we take that more metaphorically and analytically into theory is a question. And then, and then to acknowledge um, and, and think with you know, abolition, which is which is inhabiting more and more, uh, I think, you know, crit critical theory and critical race theory. And it was really interesting reading The Guardian today, where um, it was it was announced that the Department of Homeland Security, notwithstanding that Biden has just been elected, 
mm. is sending a flight of, of Cameroonians um, who are in asylum in the United States back to Cameroon tomorrow morning. Okay, and that is despite the fact that the previous flight of Cameroonians sent out of the United States under Trump have not been located and have disappeared, um, and that Cameroonians from, the, um, from Anglophone Cameroon right now are being sent back from the United States to Cameroon face extrajudicial killings. Um, this is happening today, um, but I was interested for our purposes in some of the banners held by the protesters who were protesting what the Department of Homeland Security is doing today. Um, and on those banners were um, abolish DHS. In other words, going for an abolition logic, you know. So I think, you know, Helena, just to finish off before we ask other people to contribute, I'm really just trying to start pushing the possibilities of the decarceral um, as, as a critical resource for the kinds of conversations we're having in relation to the earth as a prison, the carceral, et cetera. But to think about the, the distinctions between the decarceral and the abolitionist in relation to bodies of thinking around the decolonial and the Afro-pessimist, for, for example. So, you know, I haven't, I haven't got, you know, I haven't got all the way down the line, but I'm starting to think how from countries outside the United States, you know, when substantive prison populations have in fact been released. And I haven't seen any discussion in critical theory on this, on prison release. Um, I've only seen very small items of journalism on it. But could we harness that as a critical resource for, for our, our thinking as we try to manage multi-crisis, um, you know, in our local terrains, but also at a planetary scale today? So those have been my, my questions. Um, because I do believe that critique has to hold out some kind of possibility or politics of the future as, as well. And I would speak to decarceration in that sense. So thank you. For that. Um, do you think we should uh, open like the, the space for, um, for the rest of the people to ask questions, Aura? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. there's one here. I need to make the translation as I go. So uh, let me try to do it. So, uh, Agrinta de la Rosa, she asked uh, if you think that there's a relationship in the way in which um, indigenous art from Latin America and from Africa are produced and consumed. Um, this in the frame uh, that could be a historical past, politically and social and that this, uh, this uh, past of the art in these two contexts, they share an experience of colonization, exploitation, abuse, and discrimination. So basically, I think that, um, that there is a question about how uh, indigenous art is produced and consumed, both in Africa and in America. Yeah, um, I, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's quite complex in the sense that we wouldn't, we in the first instance wouldn't use the word indigenous as such, we would use the word African. Um, um, and, um, and that would largely refer to black African, um, uh, particularly in a decolonial critique. Um, I think that notwithstanding the different kinds of framing, um, that there would be an in incredibly rich conversation to be had between the two, um, the two traditions, um, precisely because of histories of colonization, but also in relation to works that that do exist um, across this continent that are pre-colonial form. So, um, so many, 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 many forms of African art are produced through and via. The colonial process, the colonization process, but many others are, are produced before that. Um, um, and so, which is not to say there weren't sort of, you know, histories of internal colonization on the African continent and so on. So there would be that, um, um, that, that I think, I, I mean, I've never seen really such a, such a study. And, and part of that terrain would be 
a, a sort of articulation of, a, of an analytical frame around the multiplicity of being and the ancestral, the, the resources of the ancestral. I think that, 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 that what one sees, broadly speaking, um, in these traditions from, from the point of view of scholars working on them now, it would speak to those two terrains. Um, and the degree to which the African ancest ancestral continues to, to inform um, kind of more modernist articulations of, of African modes of being. So very, very powerful traditions um, and articulations. So we should really try in a seminar, you know, going forward to put these two traditions together and start to think with them um, in relation to, but also against, um, you know, we're coming out um, under the side of the Anthropocene and so on. I think it would be very, very powerful. Um, the way in which they consumed would probably also be, in, you know, really, really similar. The way in which they are consumed by certain Western audiences and the kinds of frames that those Western audiences give to this work, as opposed to the frames that Africa-based intellectuals would give them, or Mexican scholars would offer them, you know, so it's always that uh, that sort of complex articulation of these forms against and in relation to the knowledge discrepancies and articulations across North and South. Um, so it, it would be a really powerful conversation for us to convene, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, there are any more questions around? Otherwise we can, I think, uh, keep going with this one because like, I mean, like the, the history around as well, the relationship with in what we call indigenous art in Latin America and in Mexico, it's very peculiar in the sense that it was completely um, absorbed by the Western um, function of the art. And then so indigenous production was um, was translated or uh, configured as craft, basically. Mm -hmm. So yeah. nowadays there is a discussion in which uh, there is the question of what is indigenous art and contemporary art, basically. I mean, how we we think uh, contemporary indigenous art in 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 the same uh, or in in contraposition, but like in conversation at least with the production that it's been made in the contemporary world. And it's been very interesting. Mok just did a very, very interesting um, as, um, colloquium or symposium with Tate around those issues, because it hasn't been a, a, an issue in Mexico. And I think we need to start dealing with the fact that um, as a nationalist project, what they did with the art was to create this kind of, um, the indigenous was good because it was dead somehow. And what was yeah. the, the yeah. present was just like the fusion of, of the mestizo. Yeah. So it is very complicated and it's very interesting as well how to relate with those, um, with, with the, the, the coincidences, but also the differences between um, the colonial past and from in Africa and in America. I mean, um, we both have like a very colonial, of course, uh, past and legacies and that, but they, the, the way that it, they were part of the configuration of the, of the nation state, it's completely different. And the way we need to decolonize that, it's also different, but we, we can learn from the archives of the other. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a long tradition here too of, of African, in other words, black African art being, being named as craft, absolutely for sure. Um, I think that's being overturned very, very fundamentally uh, and in very important ways by critical academic projects. Um, here, there, there was a, a, a very interesting exhibition at the Witz Art Gallery that I just wanted to mention called Premonition recently. And it drew together digital art um, with divination art. So the art of divination um, under the sign of premonition. In other words, both the digital and the, the and, and divination practices trying to to think about the thing that's there and not there, um, the thing that haunts, which could be the ancestral, it could be um, the trauma of colonialism, it could be, um, you, you know, the, the capacity to find the equivalent of water, but all of these ways of thinking outside of, of the sort of strictly, I suppose, 
tradition of the Enlightenment, etc. Um, and so, it, yeah, it was one of the most productive things. As I was trying to say, digital art in, in, in Johannesburg at the moment mm. is really making this argument for African past as African futures. In other words, think about the past as a way of navigating an African future. And I find that I find that really, really profound. In other words, think with the past and those pathways that it offered um, to think into a decolonized future. That's, it's really very, very powerful. And so this idea of bringing together divination practices with, with, um, with, with, with what's possible these days online, with, um, with, with algorithms, et cetera, uh, I think is, is, a, is an interesting nexus that speaks to the present moment quite powerfully, yeah. Yeah, that, that is very interesting. And I think it's a very important work to do yeah. because also the, the, um, the history of how past has been read by Marxism in yeah. a way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was here in Achille in a recent conference on, on reparation and the importance of the past in order to think the future, but also was here in a conference of um, Judith Butler with um, a Chilean uh, art, critique mm -hmm. and Nelly Richard. And it was very beautiful because uh, at some point, uh, Judith Butler said something like, um, uh, Antigona would have been um, opposing Marx or critiquing Marx uh, because the death shouldn't bury the death. We are the ones that need to bury the death. So we need to push. So she was talking about the protest and how those legacies of past protests were the ones that were in a very weird and strange way, actualizing or demanding their existence somehow, yeah. not, er, not always in a very coherent way, but maybe sometimes yeah. very visceral. Uh, but yeah, I think that the, the problem of time and past and future is one of the most important today in relation to how yeah. we keep going. Um, yeah. So there's a, a few ones that uh, we can do before we finish. Uh, one is uh, Isis Jeppes asks, what will it be the new layer or layers of explosion, not just in the pandemic university, but also in the pandemic culture and art institutions? Because uh, they heard, they they also checked your the podcast that Vice her yeah. was doing. So I guess some of them they hear your podcast about the university in COVID times, which I think it's also very interesting and important thing to discuss. Well, the new layers in the pandemic university is a of exclusion is a completely different conversation which I addressed there and I'm not sure how to link it up exactly to this. Um, but I suppose we could think about the question of what happens to public art or live art in the context of the pandemic. Um, because that art, you know, sort of produces its critical function, including inside the university precisely by having an audience and by being performed live. Um, so that particular artwork I showed you by um, Tristan Bilium Sazani what, was, was a live, live art performance, which was absolutely extraordinary in what it could articulate around, you know, the removal of that statue setting in motion sort of colonial processes which were echoed around the world in universities. And so I think that another layer, yet another layer, which I didn't discuss in the podcast, to think about is the role of art inside of universities and what becomes disabled in terms of what kinds of conversations and audiences and art practices they you know live art can convene in the context of an ongoing pandemic um, in which we expect a second wave uh, and and in a in a context where universities um, are fundamentally at some level moving online then what happens to the resources um, uh, of, of art, including live art and performance art, and the role that it's played within the decolonization of universities is a question that might link, you know, what we talked about last time and what we we're talking about today. Um, and of course, art has the capacity to hold together questions of multi-crisis and an, and, and an expanded and extended notion of the carceral precisely because it's operating on so many levels. Um, I mean, Foucault talked about the technologies of the self in his very late work um, as a way of trying to convene 
the information about the self in order to exist inside of what he calls the archipelagos of the carceral. Mm. Uh, in other words, rather than escaping the system altogether or abolishing it, trying to manage in some senses within it. And it seems to me that, that live art and performance art is able to mount um, the critical resources and the analytical terrain um, that decolonial projects actually really need and rely on. And, and for me, art has been much more profound in its capacity to intervene than fiction, for example, um, in recent processes around how we ought to be changing universities and, um, and, and, and the cultures of harm that they bring in particular to black students. So that would be one way to link up the different conversations between institutions and epistemologies, I think. Yeah, and, and, and it's been, I think it's super important right now because like, as you, you have explained and addressed this, this conference, um, like the carceral is just like uh, expanding and, and in this moment it's in our structures and it's in, within yeah. our institutions and it is in the school yeah. and there is in the governmental instructions of how to deal with the pandemic, but it's getting very, I mean, the system is getting there. So it's very interesting to think that maybe the art can be some some form of, of cracking this kind of- uh, oh, Some kind of, you know, de decarceral, you know, impetus in some respects. I hope so, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's one other thing, but I, I don't know how you're doing with time, Sarah. I think you needed to go at uh, 30, isn't it? Well, um, I would like to finish in the next, you know, three, three to four minutes, but we could take a final question if you'd like to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there's one that uh, uh, Patricia asked you if you if you can explain a little bit more of the environmental racism. Yeah. Well. Um, so uh, there are so many dimensions to that, and perhaps perhaps a paper of this kind really needed to go into it more clearly. Um, but one, of course, is around climate refugees, people who need to move in a state of unsettlement because of climate crisis. Um, and so these are not regular migrants, but people who have to move because uh, their land is now underwater um, or they live in a, in, a, in a state of complete and utter drought. Or if, as it is happening in East Africa at the moment, there are swarms and swarms and swarms of locusts. Um, you know, it sounds kind of biblical in a way, but swarms and swarms of locusts. So all of this stuff is happening because of climate change and people become refugees of a different order. And of course that, that, um, that fits very neatly into the categories of racism that we have always seen in relation to refugees, um, but particularly exacerbated in relation to climate refugees coming from Africa, coming from the global south. Uh, etc. So we, we can just see, you know, that that that's, that that environmental racism um, is is a project that apparently speaks in the name of the planet, but is going to be very unhappy when climate refugees arrive on the steps of the the wealthier countries. And so there's that. Um, there, um, I think that you know, I think that th that would be the one that comes to to, to mind at the moment. But there's a really complex nexus around invoking the natural world and invoking the bodies of people who've often been um, placed on a continuum with the natural world. I think that the, all the different languages of, of, of racism would speak, um, I think, very profoundly to articulations of the Anthropocene, which we've started to, to critique in our conversation today again, um, which suggests that it's 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 the human species itself which has brought this upon itself. And we know perfectly well that it's the overdeveloped countries that have brought this upon um, the, the countries of the South. Um, but it's the countries of the South that, that will suffer the, suffer the most and be excluded, therefore, from these kinds of carceral archipelagos of the rich, which I talked about, about earlier. And so these notions of inequality always map onto to race, racism and, and the outsider um, as the body in particular of the African. And so you can see, I think, how, how these questions of environmental racism will, will play out um, and will produce sort of new versions of the carceral, uh, new notions of exclusion um, against which the Global South will strongly push 
um, if we can start developing a vocabulary of, of, of decarceration, which I think is a project for Southern theory, actually, um, and, and a form of Southern politics, which is contesting the kind of global world order that we find ourselves within. So that's what I have to say on that, Helena. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for, for sharing these ideas. I think it's very important for us. Um, thank so you. To keep sharing these archives and that and yeah. to think, I mean, I don't know if I need to respond today, if I would keep going, it's also to hear these kind of conversations and to, okay. to be able to imagine different connections and different um, yeah. images yeah. that allow us to think differently. So yeah. thank you so much for this and I hope we can keep going with the <laughs> it's, it's been so, Helena, it's been such a pleasure and I just wish that I could see you in person. It's horrible to see you only on a screen. So let's hope within a year or so we can we can be in the same room anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean I'm just like hoping to go back to Johannesburg, but it seems difficult now. But we'll we'll see. And we'll Arturo, see. Also, thank you so much for thank being you everyone. Here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Elena, for your insightful comments. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Thanks to everyone. And good Thanks night. Thanks to Mark for everything. Thanks, for your Bye bye. Have a good, bye. Have a good evening and a good bye. afternoon in Mexico. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Leo. Bye. Gracias a todos.